All right, morning, everybody. Uh, before before we start, yeah, uh, just a bit of quick introduction about myself. But before I start, uh, let me gather a little bit of background about you guys. Uh, how many of you are first year students? First year. You never enjoying life, like, yeah, First year. Second year. Second year. Okay, not too bad. Uh, third year. Third year. Fourth year, yeah, Fourth year. Fourth year. Couple of you. Okay, uh, this one, postgrad, yeah, postgrad, few of you postgrads, mainly uh, master, PhD, uh, mixture of them, uh. and then, okay, this one, lecturers, uh, lecturers, any lecturers mix inside the group? Okay, uh, most of you are from ComScience, have a show of hand? ComScience, you, which one? Uh, e. 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 Have a show of hands. E. Okay. Have a e. Uh, the rest? Huh? Mechanical. M.E. Mechanical engineering. Okay. All right. So just to, just to get a bit of background uh, so that I, I know how to tailor my speech. Uh, so what else I need to know? Okay. That, that, that's about it. Now for, uh, for you guys, how many of you heard of data science already? Like you heard of data science, big data, you are here because of AI, machine learning, yeah, okay? So to disappoint you, this, this workshop got nothing to do with AI, okay? But it will prepare you for the future because I will, I will cover all those things that you need to know about machine learning, about data science, and that's the fundamentals of AI. Uh, my job is chief data scientist, so I, I was the state advisor for Johor and Selangor in smart city and data automation. So what I did there was, you, if you're from Johor, you, you, you're probably familiar with places like uh, Iskandar, Penggerang, IBD. So those are the smart city projects. So I was the uh, advisor for that and then in Smart Selangor project as well. Now I've conducted in-house training for Intel, HP, Standard Chartered, so those are some of my clients. Anyone heard of Magic, Magic in Cyberjaya? Yeah. So, so that is a startup accelerator that uh, we founded in 2014-2015. So I founded the uh, Magic Academy. Okay, so we help entrepreneurs to uh, fast track their business, to accelerate their business with different business skills and also technology, different technical skills. My background was uh, software development and web development, so I, I wrote in many different languages, C Sharp, C++, Java, Pascal, PHP a little bit, uh, mainly ASP, ASP.NET, and also JavaScript. So uh, fast forward, web development, we use a lot of JavaScript and HTML, CSS stuff. Uh, when I was in Australia, I co-founded this startup called Happen.com and also Hero Boyfriend. So these are some startups that I utilize web development skills and also natural language processing. And I work at Microsoft E Research Center before I came back to Malaysia and HRDF certified trainer and MQA expert panelist certified university program. So this one probably something that's more related to, to you all. I see in the MQA board mainly for big data, IT and data science subjects. So those degree programs uh, came from my hand, my endorsement. Okay, so uh, done the ice breaking. Okay, so let me cover a little bit of the building blocks of data science. Yeah, uh, most of the most of the time when you when you Google data science on uh, on Google, you will see this chart. So this chart will cover the roadmap of the skills that you need to know about data science. I'll, I'll send this to you later on. But mainly it covers different areas from fundamentals, mathematics, statistics, programming, uh, machine learning, text mining, NLP, visualization. Uh, data ingestions, big data, data munging, and toolbox. So data munging, data ingestions, and uh, big data, these are more infrastructure problems. Okay, for big data case, right, a lot of people think that uh, data science is all about big data, you need to know how to store big data. Like, for example, just now Dr. Lo introduced the background about Hadoop, right? So that is a major part of data science, but that falls under the category of data engineering. So if you are more infrastructure guy, if you are more interested in data engineering, how to collect data reliably from different sources and how to uh, have an infrastructure to store data that Amazon, Uber, Grab, 
Facebook, Yahoo, that, that sort of scale, right? That is more of a big data problem. But for most of us, if you are entering business, your key here is more of the data science issue. Now, the, it might look a bit overwhelming for most of you, but the good news is a lot of things, you especially as a university student, this is your chance to grab those things, okay? I hate mathematics. Okay, I hate mathematics. Not every data scientist loves mathematics, yeah? And you don't need to have a PhD in data science or master in data science. There's no such thing. That is an evolvement from or evolution from last time. So before that I was doing data mining. So some of your subjects might have still related to data mining, meaning that we gather information from data. But nowadays, if I tell people that I do data mining, people think that I'm mining Bitcoin. So we no longer use the term data mining, so we have a better, more atas term, like, yeah, which is data science. A lot of the things, if you look at the first three, right? Fundamentals, like algebra, statistics, probability theory, Bayesian theory, a lot of those mathematics stuff that you will only learn in university. Yeah? When, you, when you go out of university where you graduated, right, you, were, you, were, you will use, you will apply Bayesian theory in a lot of fields in, in your daily life, but you will never know that. Let's say probability theory. What, how, how do you learn probability theory in high school in mathematics? Uh, you have two bags of balls, right? Blue balls, red color balls. Take out a red color balls, put it back. What is the probability or what are the chances that you draw another red color ball? Are you going to do that in your real life? Uh, no. Uh, but that is what you are going to apply in data science. For example, you, you receive an email, right? You draw a single word. You, you take out a word from the email. Now, based on the word that you see in the email, I want you to tell me what is the probability that this email is a spam mail. Mm. So this is, this is the same thing, right? But we, don't, we use it, but we don't tell you the way that you learn it in your university. Okay? So uni students, this one I only talk to uni students. Yeah? A lot of people, when, let's say when they're adult, when they're working adults, when they come to my courses, right? I will never tell them that they need to learn that because it, it's too, I wouldn't say it's too late, but they just don't have the time and commitment to pick up those things. So I'll train them more on the the technical skills and business application skills. For you guys, if you want to become an AI developer, you want to become a machine learning engineer, please make sure that you have very good mathematics fundamentals. Yeah? Even though if you don't like it, like, uh, I, I don't think anybody will wake up and feel like, oh, I, I want to write some mathematical equations. No, no such thing, right? First thing you wake up, you what? open Facebook. <sighs> right? Look at your notifications. Now you know that the Facebook notification also arranged in the sequence according to your psychology. Yeah? The very first icon in Facebook is the most important, second one is the second important, and the third one is the least important. Meaning your notification is the least important. The one that you care the most is your friend request, followed by your inbox, then your notifications. Now the third one is programming. Most of you would have learned a little bit of programming during your, your degree, right? Uh, C, C++ is uh, from electronics background, or a little bit of Java, uh, Python programming. How many of you used Python before? Have a show of hands. A little bit. Yeah, just a, uh, at your own time or part of the part of the course. Or you you practice at your own time. Or part of your requirements of the practice at your own time. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, the other stuff, for example, machine learning and text mining, right? I wouldn't want you to specialize into any of this yet because you are still at your uni. Only when you graduated, you slowly discover your interest. Now, my interest, when I was doing my PhD, my interest is on unstructured data, which is number five, text mining and NLP. NLP stands for Natural Language Processing. So NLP, back then, NLP wasn't that useful. When I started my PhD, 2009, it was 10 years ago already, time flies. So Twitter just started. Facebook started in 2006, 2005 like that. So Facebook, Twitter just started and we have a lot of social media data and people don't know how to analyze those data because we are very used to analyze long articles, sentiment analysis, uh, text topic detection, data mining, text mining on long form of documents. Now, you use Google every day, right? But you, never, you have never thought of what makes Google so powerful is that Google is able to take a very short keyword, meaning that you just need to enter one or two keywords, and it's able to guess what is your search intention and match it to much longer documents that you want, 
right? Computer science students or programming students, you will know. You just type some one or two keywords in Google, it will link you to the Stack Overflow website that you want to know. So that is the unique part of Google. But the hard part when I was doing my research was NLP. NLP is very useful today, not only on analyzing your social media like Twitter or Facebook status. Uh, if you're using Siri, that is also part of NLP. From an engineering point of view, Siri basically take your, your speech, convert into text. But to convert those text into actions, right, into computers understandable actions, is actually part of the natural language processing. So you will choose your own um, specializations after that. Yeah? So don't get too worried about machine learning. Now in terms of skill sets as a data scientist, uh, like what I say, right, it's a combination of all three. Now you have hacking skills, which is programming and coding skills. Now hacking skills is slightly different from uh, programming. There are different levels of programming. Number one is coding. The lowest level is coding. You learn how to write codes. And number two, you learn how to write programs. But programs only does very small things. Yeah, small, small things like uh, a simple programs that script. Twitter, script Instagram from the website, okay? So those are programming. Now when you move on over programming, then you have a developer. So you start to develop something. You develop a system, you develop a web application. And finally, you become an engineer. So you architect the entire uh, system like Facebook, Google, Grab, or even smaller one, uh, e-commerce website like Lazada. Okay, so that, those are different levels of programming. And data science requirements is more on the coding and programming side. So what, what you all need to do is learn how to write simple programs that help you to automate a lot of tasks. In data science, a lot of tasks that we do are, are repetitive. Okay? We are repeating our tasks, like for example, go to Twitter every day to collect the keywords that we want to know, script newspaper websites to uh, learn what are the key topics over there. Now the second things that you need to know is mathematics and statistics knowledge. Okay, this one I wouldn't go through too much, but uh, from the statistics uh, statistic point of view, you need to know how to test hypotheses. You need to know what are the different types of distribution, Gaussian distribution, normal distribution. Now the last one is the substantive expertise. When you graduated, and if you want to become a machine learning engineer, data scientist, or even AI developer, you need to pick a few, a particular industry that you are passionate about. Okay, a lot of our students came from like legal, pharmaceutical, medical, healthcare. There are different types of skills that you can apply. So these are the. This is what makes data science so unique because it's a combination of the three things. Okay. Now this is an interactive session, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand, okay, I'll answer to you. So some of the key mathematics concepts for data science, you don't have to know uh, every single of them. This is not an exhaustive list, and there's no particular order, but you do need to know how to apply them. Yeah. So this is what, uh, if, you, if you go out and you attend any meetups, this is what people will tell you, their views about data science. Okay, you ask anybody outside, they will, some of them they will tell you, uh, actually, data science is all about big data. And then you talk to another person, they'll say, oh, if you want to learn data science, you need to become a machine learning engineer, you need to learn machine learning. And some people will tell you, data science is all about programming. Yeah, so you just need to learn Python or R. How many of you use R here? Any? No, not really, yeah? Okay, that's fine. Now, R is more for mathematician and statistician to use because of the notation. Now, if you are coming from a comp science background, programming engineering background, Python is fine. And then lastly is AI. Yeah. So all of these are correct. They are all part and parcels of uh, bits and pieces of data science, but it does not capture the entire picture of data science. But once you learn data science, you pick up data science, you are able to venture into different uh, areas okay so before we start off with our activities right this is the data science process that I want you to remember oh yeah by the way uh, we do have some goodies for you all so later on we'll ask some questions for those that you can answer the question correctly you will get you get some uh, special gifts from us you get from Miss Wee later so this is a data science process or what we call it the awesome framework. So the word awesome came from the abbreviation, uh, uh, the short forms of all the five steps. Yeah? 
every single data science project follows the same methodology. This is a framework. You get to decide what are the methods and what are the different tools that you want to use. Now, for example, today is your first day at work. You go and get a job. Now, you, you, very, very typical scenario. Your boss will give you a data set. Okay, your boss will give you a data set and tell you, nah, okay, you are a data scientist, eh? uh, you pandai, eh? sexy unicorn, so they will tell you, tell me what I don't know about this data set. Okay? And in particular, trading, retails, they have tons of data, but those data are very fragmented. So your first, very first step in data science is to gather the relevant data sources, uh, get data from different sources. You have different sources that you, you get. If you are lucky, if you are really, really lucky, you get CSV file. If you are really lucky, you get CSV file. Uh, if you have done a lot of good things in your past life, you get SQL databases. Uh, if you are somebody who kick a dog or cats at the roadside, you get text file. Uh, if you have never done any good things in your life, you get PDF and PPT. Uh, that is very common. So these are the common types of data that you get. And once you get those raw data, it's not the complete story. It's just the very beginning. Data scientists spend 60 to 80% of our time cleaning data, uh, which is the second step, right? We clean our data so that the machine can understand. Imagine you work in a company, let's say my client was Johor Corporation. We have 20 over different types of data sources from different systems for the past 10 to 20 years. You have SQL, you have MySQL, you have Microsoft SQL, you have CSV, you have JSON, and not all those files, they are labeled properly. Some of them, they have funny uh, title. You, you are programmers, you know, right? You, nobody will understand the variable names, including yourself. Uh, even you also, you, you also don't understand, let's say, uh, now, next, next month, right? Next month is, uh, there's a lot of uh, final exams, graduation, so you are, you, some of you are going to look for jobs. Okay, after graduation, you look for jobs, your boss asks you about your final project, sure. Explain to me your final project, okay, when I interview, uh, ta -ta. You forgot why you do that, right? So that is the part that's important. You need to clean your data so that the machine will understand. You need to standardize all the data format into a single, single way so that it can be analyzed. Now, the third part is E, which is what we call the exploration stage. This is where you explore the data. Exploring data is to help you to find patterns and also trends in your data set. Uh, some people, they tend to look for uh, uptrend, downtrends, and some people look for outliers, missing values. There are many, many different techniques that you can use to handle the exploratory data analysis. And most of you, when you graduated, right, your, the number one thing in your head is actually the modeling part. Modeling part is so-called the, the fun part, yeah? but modeling, in fact, is the easiest in the entire process if you know what to do with your data. Okay? If you know your data well, modeling part is not hard. There are only a couple of modeling algorithms. All right, uh, decision trees, uh, supervised, unsupervised technique, decision trees, random forest, yada, 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 the common one. Only when you have a very unique situations, then it requires you to use deep learning framework. Okay, for example, Keras, uh, TensorFlow, or PyTorch. Now lastly, the last one is the hardest skills to, uh, to obtain interpreting the results. A lot of people, they are very good in applying the model. Applying model is not hard, right? You just go to their, their website, get the documentation, you can, you can run some uh, sample code, replace it with your own data, you get the results. The hard part is those modeling process, some of them, they are black box. So if your model performs very well, you don't know why. If your model don't perform, you also don't know why. So the last part is the important part where you, you as a data scientist, eventually you need to explain the model and the results to other people. And the other people, what I meant is, it's not just your, your friends, your colleagues, they are non-technical people. You cannot just 
take a model and explain to somebody, say this is decision tree, this is the hyperparameters, I did 10 iterations to, to tweak it. No, it, it doesn't work that way. You Sometimes you have to explain to your supervisor, sometimes you have to explain to the panel if you're a PhD student. So these are the things that you need to take note. Okay, any questions? Okay, how many of you uh, decided to become a data scientist after graduate? Uh, I know this is a million dollar question. Now I have a show of hand. Usually it's like that. Huh? Statistically, this is correct. But after the talk, a lot of you will come and yeah, PM, PM, PM. <laughs> okay, now in data science, uh, the most important part before you get to the awesome framework is actually your business question. All right, so for those of you who did your research, you know, yeah, uh, conceptual framework, set up your uh, business question, hypothesis, problem statement. So before we do everything with data science, you must first consider what problems it needs to be solved. Okay. Now for business, right, there are only two types of questions that you will want to answer. Number one, increase the revenue. Business will always ask you to apply data science to help them to increase their revenue, make more sales, basically. Right, bosses will tell you, okay, I want to increase my sales by X number of percent next quarter. And the other one is to save costs. A lot of bosses will tell you they want to save costs so that uh, to reduce manpower, to reduce wastage. Now, my question to you, which one is easier? Which one is easier, to save costs or to increase revenue? How many of you think save cost is easier? Save cost is easier. Increase revenue? Okay. Now, save cost is the correct answer. Yeah. In reality, because cost saving is within your control. Within your organization, you can control. You can easily find something you are wasting, yeah? Even though you are, uh, the easiest one to identify, right, is waste of time. Yeah, a lot of people waste time in different workflows, different processes. Otherwise, you can cut down unnecessary spending, all right? Increased revenue is, is not up to you. Even if you work in an advertising environment, for example, you can increase your, your marketing budget, you can put in more money into the campaign, different campaigns. We've tried that many times, right? Let's say you run Facebook ads. No matter what you put in, the people just, doesn't, they just don't want to buy your product. So your revenue won't increase. And in some cases, let's say in Facebook advertisement, you've seen an ad too many times, it might cause your sales to drop because the audience gets sick of your thing. They see your brand also, they feel disgusting. Okay? So that is the case. So save, cost saving is always easier. Okay. Then. And this is another thing before you graduate, yeah? Another chart that I want you to remember. On your left-hand side is information. On your right-hand side is optimization. This is called the Gartner Analytic Ascendancy Model. Within the data science community, we have used this chart many, many times. Right? And from bottom to top is the different business value that the activities is going to bring to us. Now, most of the people, when they do statistical analysis, we are focused on the area of descriptive analysis, meaning that you look at the sales from the past three months, you look at the average, you look at the uh, mean, you look at the max, this very descriptive analytics. All right? it, you, you describe what happened. Okay? But those are the information that, that's what we call in hindsight. You're looking backward. Right? You're looking backward. You look at what happens in the past three months. So those, what happened in the past three months has already become a history. So what you need to know is, and that's where business consultant comes in. Business consultants will always come in and say, hey, Mr. So-and-so, let me help you to go through your data to find actionable insights for your company. Right? Okay? And what they meant by actionable insight is that they tried to analyze the entire situation. They tried to help you to find out uh, why did it happen? Why did your sales drop by 20% last quarter? Why did your subscriber go up by 5% last quarter, etc., etc. And from there, we as a data scientist, we come in. Once we get hold of those data, we are able to use that to help us to build different types of models so that we can use that model to help us to predict. 
Okay, in different industry, the prediction analytics or the predictive analytics, the performance and the accuracy differs. Okay, for example, if you're working in a real estate, you're working in a property industry, your job is to predict the property price of, let's say, Batu Pahal or Kluang. So if your performance is not good, the, the error range can be 10, 50,000. That's okay. Right? That's for property. Now, even if you work in a sales environment, you work in a retail company, you want to predict the sales volume for next semester, next, next quarter, right? That is also fine. If you mispredict a little bit, you know, your boss won't kill you. But there's something that if you are doing, let's say, medical, this is something that's very serious. Yeah? Medical always require us to have 99.9997% or even 100%. We are always aiming for 100%. For example, you are doing cancer prediction, right? If, if your accuracy is 99%, meaning that every 100% that you're treated, there's one person that you are, mispre you are mistreated. So that's something that's very bad. So predictive analytics is to, is to predict what will happen. And lastly, our foresight is how you apply your machine learning results, and that's where AI comes in, okay? Prescriptive analytics. So how can we make it happen? Take it as an example, right? I can predict, okay, we can predict or forecast the temperature of tonight or the weather condition. Let's say I predict that tonight is going to rain. Now, tonight is going to rain, what does it mean to you? If you want to go out with your friends, instead of driving, let's say you're riding a motorbike, you know that tonight is going to rain, you probably don't want to ride a motorbike. Yeah, you ask your friend to come and pick you up. So this is where prescriptive analytics that is going to impact you. Now, in business sense, of course, there's a lot of business decisions that needs to be made every day, right? So those are the part where we optimize it and then we op automate the entire process and workflow. Okay, so remember this chart. It's a process from information to optimization. Data science or statistical modeling is all about optimization. You're trying to reduce the gap between the predicted value, the y hat value, and your actual observed value. Now, from a business point of view, it's always from BI, business intelligence, to artificial intelligence. Okay, any questions so far? Yeah. Right. So uh, one last thing before we go into our uh, hands-on exercise. There are, there are few questions that data science can help you to answer. It doesn't matter whether you are working on a final year project or you are working on a business project. These are the types of questions that data science can help you. Okay. Number one, is this A or B? Is that the A, B questions? Number two, is this normal or weird? Okay. Number three, how much or how many? Number four, how things are organized? And lastly is, what should I do? What sort of action, what sort of decision should I make? So if you think about it, a data science project is just like you making a, a smoothie. Now when you want to make a smoothie, the first thing that you want to do after you have identified the smoothie, the flavor that you want, let's say today you feel like uh, uh, strawberry smoothie. Okay? So you go online and look for the recipe. The recipe is very easy to find nowadays. Everybody, everywhere you get free recipe. Right? Everything is open source. So once you get the recipe, which is equivalent to your algorithm, so you have decided, let's say today your job is you want to predict, um, let's say, weather. Okay? You want to do some weather forecast. You know that you are going to need to predict the value, so you are going to need regressions method. Then, after you have found the algorithms, right, you need to go and gather the ingredients that you want. Okay, you need yogurt, you need milk, you need strawberries. So the second things that you need are actually the ingredients. And in data science project, those ingredients are your data. So I always tell my students is that garbage in, garbage out. Data is the most important thing in your smoothie. If you use uh, uh, the ingredients that is, they are not fresh, then your result wouldn't be nice. Your smoothie will taste bad. The other two, which is your computer and the answer. Answers is just the final outcome, which is your smoothie. And computers is just a blender. So depending on how powerful is your algorithm, um, 
how advanced is the algorithm. So if you are doing some deep learning projects that with a lot of training data, you need a much powerful, much, much more powerful computers that has GPU, for example. But if you are doing some basic classification regressions project, then a small laptop like this is fine. And also another skill that you as a, as a data scientist or when you graduate as an engineer, you need to know a little bit of web development and also cloud computing. Because in future, you might not want to invest, let's say you are going to run a deep learning TensorFlow project. You are not going to spend 80,000 just to set up a server to run the project. You might not have the money, your boss might not approve the budget. But if you know how to use cloud computing like Google Cloud, Azure, or AWS, let's say, you can easily go online and get some of the free credits and then start some of the cloud instances and do the project for you. All right. It's at a very, very low cost. So that is the key of the computers. All right. So let's look at the types of data science question that we are we're handling here, we're tackling here. The very first one is, is this A or B? Now in technical sense, in data science sense, this is called classification. So what does classification do? Classification algorithms or classification techniques help us to handle Questions like, will this employee leave us next month? Yes or no? This is what we do in HR. And which advertisement is more effective? If you're doing digital marketing, you're going to uh, predict which headline is going to get you more clicks. And that's why when you go to Facebook, you see a lot of heading that always looks similar. You wouldn't know what happened to this guy until you read this. Uh, dot, dot, dot. The reason why they all use the same, same type of tone, same type of words, okay, or they say, three, uh, guys love this, three steps to get your six pack in two weeks. Uh, this, uh, you laugh, right? Now you know. It works. Yeah? It works because digital marketer has run a lot of tests, a lot of A-B tests, a lot of different testing so that they know what sort of things that is going to get you interested so that you click. Yeah? And last one is, what movie category is this? So in practical, we do a lot of uh, experiments using classification. For example, Netflix, uh, they classify different types of movies, uh, telcos, or service company, or even normal companies. We use it to predict whether our staff will leave or whether our subscribers will change from, let's say, from DG to uh, Cellcom, for example. Okay. Now, if you're if you interested in a classification problem, you can, you can look for this article that I wrote uh, a while back. Learn how to uh, combine computer vision and chicken rice. It's probably not the best time to always talk about food today, but uh, you, you learn how to separate between steamed chicken and roasted chicken using machine learning algorithms. This is built on top of Google Cloud Platform, GCP. Everybody can try it out. I put my data set online for free also, so that you know how to uh, set up computer visions, how to label the data set, how to practice the entire awesome framework. And also, without writing a single line of code, you can do machine learning already. Yeah. Second question that we are going to look at is, is this normal or weird? Now, is this normal or weird is, in technical terms, we call this anomaly detection. Anomaly is something that is like an outlier, that's abnormal. For example, we want to detect uh, for your credit card, right? Normally, you only spend your credit card to purchase uh, items that are 50 to 150 ringgit around the range, and suddenly somebody used your credit card to make a purchase that is 5,000 ringgit, and straight away you know that there's something wrong. It might, it might be you, it might not be you, but because it is an outlier, so the credit card company with this algorithm, they have the responsibility to inform you that, hey, there's an abnormal transaction on your credit card. Now we can also use it in procurement analysis or spend analysis. For large company, they usually do not track all the small, small purchase. For example, in universities or in corporates, they do not trace how much you spend on buying paper, uh, pencils, water, this sort of small item. But this is actually where the small, small amount of money get leaks out every single month. And that's where we do procurement analysis and spend analysis. And of course, for larger projects, this is also a very good practice for us to benchmark how much you spend for individual product against the industry price or the market rate. And what we normally use 
once again, combining computer vision with anomaly detection is this example. So if your business question is to detect whether there is there's food in this picture, and then you can see there are some foods, there are some, some dogs there. But if your question is to detect what are the uh, chihuahuas, then that's fine. Yeah? So we can, you can use this technique to detect something that is different from the entire collection. So the two methods that I have shown you before, they are all classification methods, meaning that it requires a label for you to know whether this is a chihuahua, this is a muffin, there's a steamed chicken rice, there's a roasted chicken rice, or it's a spam mail, or is this employee going to leave the company or not. This, the another method that we use is called the regression. Regression method is for us to answer the type of question which is how much and how many to predict the value. Okay. So for example, if you want to estimate the relationships between the humidity and the temperature tonight, if we can build a model to understand the relationship between these two variables, we can use the humidity to help us to predict the temperature. And also we can use it to predict the probability of spam mail or forecasting the sales. These are all using regression and also time series analysis. So the three methods that I have shown you, right, is called the supervised learning method, meaning that when we train the machine, we need to pump in information about our training data. You need a set of core ground truth, all right? You need the ground truth. There are times that you get the data set that you do not have the ground truth. And that's why data is expensive. Data is precious. You will never have enough data in real world. Even if you go to Google, if you go to Facebook, they will tell you that, no, we need more data. And that's the case, right? They always ask you to provide more data. And that's because they need label data. They need high quality data. If you have a situation that you do not have high quality data, but you still need to do some sort of analysis, and this is where you use clustering, or what we call unsupervised analysis, or unsupervised machine learning. Clustering methods is for us to group items together based on the similarity of their features. For example, if you look at the circles there, right? imagine those are the students who took a particular subject who took a particular university subjects, and these people, they are grouped together according to their enrollment, to their uh, subject preference. And based on that, we can classify that this group of students, they are similar because they pick the same subject, so they must share some common interests. And once they, you know that they share some common interests, you can cross-recommend information to them. For example, someone who took subject A, and I took subject A, B, you took subject B, C. So you're probably interested in subject C also. So I can recommend the student who took B, C, do you want to consider taking subject A? Now, the same, uh, the same algorithm is applied to personalization and recommendation. For example, in Netflix, you're watching a particular movie. Now, your friends also watch another movie. Now, you two share similar interests. You have a common interest. So you should recommend to this person saying that, hey, do you want to watch a movie that you know, most of the people who like movie A also like movie B? And that's how we apply the technique. And in industry, we can use it to predict, like, let's say if a printer always fails before 12 months, you all know that electronics product will fail ngam ngam after 12 months, right? Every time after the warranty, your product will just go yeah. But this time, you realize that there's this particular product, every time before 12 months, you will, you will go yeah. Right? Then you will realize that something is wrong. So you go back and look at the, uh, the printer models and the, the different parts that they use, and you realize that, oh, they're using a specific component that the other models do not use. It could be the drum, it could be the adapter, it could be uh, whatever, the ink, ink cartridge that you use. And that's where you identify problems as well. So these are mainly used for analysis, okay, for different types of groups that share similarities. And lastly is what should you do? Okay, what should you do is the artificial intelligence problem. This is where you apply your machine learning algorithms and your models into real world applications that take decisions. Okay? They help you to make evidence-based decisions 
to for you automatically. Uh, for example, you have air cons here. Later on, John will also explain to you different types of sensors and the relationship between sensors, IoT, and 5G networks. Now you have an air con here. The air con here is uh, it works based on remote control. We set this air con to be 24 degree, and then you always maintain at 24 degree. But down the road, a smart air conditioner system should look at how many people inside the classroom and how many air cons should be activated based on the locations, based on the heat distributions, and based on the airflow, so that you will decide, okay, 26 probably is the most optimum temperature. Now, in a lot of the uh, mechanical product or EE product, they also use the same methods to optimize the output of uh, battery. Okay, your energy output. Now, for example, if you use a wireless vacuum cleaner, the reason why wireless vacuum cleaner have very short battery life is it always output the same, um, same energy level. So if we can optimize that part, you will become a smarter version of the battery and it can extend the battery life effectively. Okay? So these are the five types of data science questions that you can answer. And Today, after the talk, right, when you go out, eh, people ask you about data science, you have to remember, data science is the fundamental of everything. AI is just the application layer. And that's why you see the word AI so often, because that's where media, reporters, politicians, government agencies, bosses, uh, especially directors of PLC, public listed companies, they all talk about AI. Everybody wants to do AI. But the reason that makes AI possible is actually machine learning. Okay? The five types of questions that I've explained to you are machine learning algorithms that we have been using for the past 50, 60 years. And it has originated from the statistical methods from our mathematicians. The mathematicians use that to do modeling. And the reason why we are able to do better machine learning today is because of computers. Last time when we only have Pen, uh, pencil and paper, right? You can only do so many things. And statistical methods are based on distribution, estimation, sampling. You cannot, you cannot just uh, gather the data of the entire population of the country. But nowadays you can, and with the help of computers, you can analyze a lot of data in a very short amount of time. And after machine learning, there are a lot of data that you just no longer able to analyze. For example, your image data. You took thousands of pictures, thousands of selfies last year, right? But when your mother or your boyfriend asks you, or your girlfriend asks you, right, where did we have dinner last year during our anniversary? You forget. You took the picture, but you forget. So that's where you need uh, other information like GPS location, you need to be able to search and recognize the food, recognize the restaurant. And that's where deep learning comes in. Yeah? You have a lot more data, a lot, large amount of data that you cannot be handled by the existing machine learning algorithms. And the essential part of deep learning is actually neural network. Yeah? Artificial neural network is the part where it powers deep learning. Okay, so in layman's term, deep learning is a subset of machine learning, and machine learning is a subset of AI. Okay, so let's go into set up your workspace. Now, any question before this? Now, who is still having issues setting up your anaconda? Come, about see? You, you can bring it over here. Otherwise, for those that you have no issue, right, you go to... Uh, Anaconda Navigator, and then you look for Jupyter Notebook. So launch your Jupyter Notebook first. If you have a problem, just bring it front. Okay. For those that you have done, right, go to this website and download the Titanic train dot CSV. Somebody, somebody. 
somebody sees at it, you can use my deep Wi-Fi, but my signal is not as strong. But it's a very small file, so you can share among each other using Bluetooth or some other methods. Okay, it's just a very, very small file. Basically, github.com slash delete io slash data science demo. Just the Titanic for now, okay? So I'm going to let you experiment to have a feeling of how is it like to work like a data scientist, okay? Now that you have downloaded the Titanic train.csv, among your table, okay, look at the CSV file and then tell me what you can learn from the CSV file. When you go outside to work, your boss is not like university assignment will tell you everything. They will just say, nah, this is the data, data set. Okay, I give you five minutes just to look at the file. You can use any, okay, any tools that you like, yeah, to analyze the file. You na pakai MATLAB pun boleh. You na pakai, if not, Excel lah, yeah, most of you.
So make sure you are able to open your Jupyter notebook. Eh? You, op you launch it from your Anaconda navigator. This one doesn't require internet. You just, if you have installed successfully, yeah, you should be able to launch it and then you click your notebook from here. This one. Okay. So once you have launched your notebook, I want you to upload the CSV file to the notebook. Okay. Once you launch your Jupyter notebook, it should look something like this. And there's an upload button here. So I want you to upload the CSV file to your Jupyter notebook. There's also online versions because you don't have internet. If you have internet, you can go for uh, Colabs or Azure notebooks, which are similar. Okay.
Okay, so when you choose your Python, yeah, make sure you choose 3.6. 3.7 is okay. We no longer use version 2 for, for many reasons, uh, mainly because it's old. Uh, only legacy system we need to support. Otherwise, we choose 3.6. The reason we don't use 3.7 because TensorFlow still does not support 3.7. Uh, so if you use 3.7, a lot of the deep learning features later on you cannot use. Yeah. But if you, if you choose 3.7, that's fine too. Yeah. That's, that's not, not a problem. It's just that you have to make some changes when you run your, your deep learning. And also Python is good because you can run multiple versions together in the same system. You just have to be able to specify. Or you can use, uh, what do you call that? Uh, virtual environment, yeah. Okay, so for those of you who, uh, if I still have questions, you can bring your laptop forward. Otherwise, I'll do my demo from here. You just need to follow step by step, yeah? So this is a real Titanic exercise uh, that we got from a competition. So this data set is Titanic train. We use it to train our model. So what we want to do is we want to predict whether somebody will survive or not during the Titanic disaster. Now the data set, this one, the, this data set that you get is a real one, okay? It's not the, the one from the movie, so you won't find Jack or Rose. Anyway, the movie is a bit out of your, your age, right? Huh? So what happened is that when you first gotten the data set, right? This is where you are at the old part. You're obtaining the data, okay? Once you obtain the data, the very first step is actually for you to understand the data. So once you open it in Excel, you have a lot of question marks in your head. You're like, Apani, what is survival? What is P class? So usually you will ask people about it. Online data set, usually they will have few descriptor, but sometimes when you are in work environment or when we go into a company, the person who designed the database already left the company. Uh, sometimes it's outsourced, so you have a lot of issues that you need to deal with. But this time, because uh, we have the data field descriptor, so the very first one is survivor. Uh, if zero is no, one is yes, passenger class, one is first class, two is second class, three is third class. We have name, you have sex, you have age, you have sibling and spouse, you have uh, patch. Sibling and spouse is the number of siblings that they have it on board together with that particular passenger. And PRCH is the number of parents or children that they have it together with them. And you have your ticket number, you have your passenger fare, you have the cabin, and you have the embark. Now the special notes I have it here for you is P class is a proxy for social economic status. So first class, second class, and uh, third class. First class being the upper, third class being the lowest, and age is in the number of years. So fractional, if the age is less than one, if the age is estimated, agaga, okay, we put a 0.5 at the end. Now these are the different types of family relationships and uh, some other description. But this one uh, will not affect our analysis much. Now my first question to you, remember, whenever you do any project, right, the very important part is to determine your question, your problem statement, and what is your outcome, what is the goal that you want to achieve. Now in this particular case, what is our business question? Which variable here is the most important that you need to know? The question, of all this, oh, sorry, uh, it's stuck. Okay. Of all this variable, survivor, passenger class, name, sex, age, siblings, parents, children, ticket, fare, cabin, embark, which one is the most important? 
survival, right? So that is your business question. Remember, it's all about increased revenue or cost reduction or optimization. Doesn't matter. In this case, we want to increase the survival rate or we want to reduce the death rate. They are, they are the same thing. So we want to find out what are the factors that contribute that will impact our survival rate, okay? So the very first thing that you are going to do Okay, everything that I give you in this code, right? Later on, I will share, I'll probably share with uh, Sean so that he will send this file and the slides to you all and you can use it in your future projects. Okay, this is business project level. So if you use it in your final year project, also your supervisor will, will give you an A. Uh, the very first one, we want to generate the plot in light. You can, you can follow this. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave the code on the screen. So the first one is to have the uh, library Okay, matplotlib is the plotting library. We want to draw it in line. And sometimes if you have a monitor that's higher resolution, you need to set it to retina so that the chart that you have will be, will be pretty. So what you are going to do is you are going to open a new notebook in your Jupyter. Okay, so you go back to your Jupyter notebook, click on new, select Python 3. If you have questions, just raise your hand. If I cannot see you, just wave. If I still cannot see you, just shout. Yes, the real, yes, scream. But best way is you, you come forward. I can help you to fix that. Okay, so once you open a new notebook, you can type here. Okay, map plot library in line. And there are also a couple of lines there. This is a little bit of setup only. Yeah? Don't worry too much. Later on, you will be using short codes. Okay, this one is the important one. After you have typed in the code, you can press Shift Enter or click on the Run button. If your code has no error, you should be seeing a one here, meaning that that particular cell has executed correctly or has executed without any problem. The good thing about this Jupyter notebook is that you are able to write codes and also you are able to write notes inside the notebook so that later on when you share your notebook with your colleagues or your teammates, they are all able to see what you have done there. The second benefit is you can store this notebook directly on GitHub or Git, any sort of version control system, and it will help you to keep a version so you wouldn't be like Glam Kabut. Oh, I forgot to save. There's no such thing. Huh? It will be auto save for you, and you can run the cell one by one. So in case any of the intermediary steps, like mathematics like that, you wouldn't want to recalculate from step 1 to step 27. You just want to probably recalculate your step 3 or step 4. All the intermediary result will be stored inside the memory. So let's say you write, like my case, yeah? I, I wrote the code, hey, sorry, alamak. Okay, let's say I wrote my code very long and then uh, up to the middle part, I realized that I made some mistake. I don't have to run the entire program all over again. I can just start from the middle part. So that is the good thing about using Jupyter Notebook as a, as a scientist or as a data scientist. Now, PANDAS, the PD here, it stands for Python's Analytics and Numerical uh, Analytics Package. NumPy is a package for us to analyze our high dimensional numbers, metrics, or anything that's above three dimensions. You can use this to help you to calculate. Uh, this is the plotting library. Now, CBON is a third party library, but it's also part of uh, Python data science ecosystem that we use it to draw beautiful charts. And lastly, we read the data set. DF equals to pd.readcsv, titanictrain.csv, which you have already uploaded to your notebook. The reason why Jupyter Notebook or Python is so powerful in data science is that it also supports a lot of different formats. You can connect to SQL servers, you can read CSV file, you can read Excel file, you can read JSON even. Okay, But still, 
PowerPoint and PDF is a bit hard. Yeah? You don't have to worry too much about the codes, the actual codes that are used here. You just have to remember the import command is for us to load the external packages that help us to do some of our tasks. Pandas is for uh, analytics. NumPy is for numerical processing. Matplot is for plotting. And then Seaborn is for us to beautify our chart. These are the four things that we need to do. Now, you do need to remember DF is stands for data frame. Okay. DF, yeah? DF is your data frame. By using a data frame, it allows us to read data into a table format that looks like this. Okay, so the next command I want you to do is to type df.h. So the CSV file that looks like unstructured to you, just now somebody said my CSV file is scrambled, right? Correct. It's scrambled to your naked eyes, to, to human eyes. And now we read that into a data frame, it becomes a structured database. Okay, it's structured table form.
Okay, so many of you was asking about what is NumPy, Pandas, or those things, right? So NumPy, Pandas, all these, they are part of Python data science ecosystem. Python itself is just a language. Now the reason why Python has become or evolved into a data science programming language is because over the years, scientists have been using Python to do a lot, of, a lot of stuff. And there are a lot of libraries that we use for scientific analysis. The reason why we don't use other tools like MATLAB or uh, RapidMiner or SAS because they are expensive. You have to pay for the software, you have to pay for the licensing, and you have to pay for the support. Python is an open source software, meaning that it's free, and you get the support directly from community. So you go to Stack Overflow, you go to different forums, you ask questions, and that's where you get the support. Now you have NumPy, which is numerical analysis. So this is built on top of Python, and from there we branch out of to a lot of different packages, scientific Python, Matplot library, symbolic, data analysis, statistical modeling, image processing, network, and also machine learning. Uh, if you remember this image, right? Okay, you all know this image, yeah? This image is also generated using Python and Jupyter Notebook and Matplotlib that you are currently learning now. Okay, so if you want to become an astronomical scientist in the end, yes, you can do that too with this. And all the information, all the data are open source. It's available online. Okay? Any questions? And the one that I have asked you to install is actually the Anaconda. Anaconda to Bapa Python lah. Uh, so it's a, it's a bigger version of Python, right? So Anaconda includes all the data science, the common data science packages that is required for us. So you don't have to go in and manually install others. But later on, if you need to install others, there are other methods that you can use like PIP install. The individual package will tell you how to do that. But most of the common ones is already included in Anaconda. You can also use the cloud version, like um, some of you have tried it, right? Google Colabs. Google Colabs is mainly for deep learning because it utilizes GPU. And you can also use Azure Notebooks yeah, for the same functionality. OK, I, I, I've written it down here also. All right, let's continue with our Titanic exercise. You can use head to look at the top five records, or you can use tail to look at the bottom records. OK. Now what I want you to do next is to call this command called describe. Now you realize that I mentioned to you in data science, we don't have to write huge programs at the very beginning. When you are learning data science, you learn how to write script. Smaller code snippets that it gets the job done. So instead of head and tail, what you can do next is you can run this command called describe and tell me what you can learn from this table.
you're, you are very innovative. I'm not worried. Yeah. So you can you can try the notebook. Nothing 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 will go wrong. Just feel free to give it a try. So df dot describe is a very handy command that later on when you take this data set, you go back, right? You can get data set from your lecturers, your senior, you can run the same template, a same process, it can help you in your projects also. What you are going to do is, it's going to give you a statistical descriptive analytics of your entire data set for all the uh, numerical columns, numerical field. For example, we can look at the count. By looking at the count, I know that in our age column, there's a lot of missing data because everybody count is 891 and only the age column, we have 714. So we got about 127 uh, data that's missing. Okay, that's number one. Number two, by looking at the mean, okay, aromatic mean, I can tell that the survival rate is very low. Yeah, there's only 38.38% people survive. Number three, standard deviation is to help you to use a statistical method to look at how far apart is the data from the mean, right? So if you look at the fare that people pay, the STD is quite high. Mean is the minimum. So minimum fare that people pay is zero. Some people did not pay anything to get on board of Titanic. But there are some people who are rich, they pay $512 to board Titanic. Now, by looking at the mean and max, it does not tell you the entire story. You need to look at the entire population. So we look at the population. 75% of the people actually only pay out to $31. Meaning that at 75% mark, the amount that this person pays is only 31, meaning that this number is ridiculously high. All right? And you have other things that you can take a look at as well. For example, the age. All right, we look at the age. Minimum age is 0 0.42 years old, and the maximum age is up to 80 years old. And passenger class. 50% of the people are actually from class three, meaning that half of the Titanic are actually third class passengers. Very little first class passenger. It's less than 25%. Okay, because at 25% is already class two. So the number, the number of passengers who are from class one is definitely less than 25%. This is how you look at this statistical information and helps you to gain some uh, big pictures or the overview of your data set. Yeah. Any question? So the checkpoint here I have for you is what can you learn from the data and why are the field, uh, why are some of the fields excluded? Some of the fields that are excluded, for example, your sex, your gender, your, uh, your port of embarkation, they are all excluded at this stage because they are non-numerical. Computers only understand numbers. In fact, computers don't even understand numbers, right? Okay, computers only understand binary, zero and one. So we are the one that give them the meaning. So we have to process the data so that it's in the form that the machine will understand, right? I have told you earlier. Now, next thing, what we are going to do is we are going to clean our data. The most important part is that number one, the age field, there are many missing age. So there are a few ways to fill out the missing age. The very popular way is to fill out the numbers with average. So we are going to fill out the mean age, uh, sorry, fill out the missing cells or missing values with the average age. So we are going to calculate the mean age and fill NA. Fill NA means that we are going to fill those now values, those are not available with the mean age that we calculate here. Okay, let's, let's do it.
Ship and turn. Ship and turn is the shortcut key, yeah? So at this stage, we are at the scrubbing stage. We just want to pre-process our data so that later on we can use it. I will cover all the way to the machine learning part so that you have a clear idea of what, how does a data science project look like. Okay? And also, by analyzing the data, we realize that the cabin and the ticket field actually does not tell us much about the information. Whether you are living in a different cabin or you bought a special ticket with numbers, you are not superstitious like me, okay? If you have number eight in your ticket, you are going to get good luck, no such thing. So we are going to draw up the columns that are not related also. This is part of cleaning our data. So we can drop the columns, which are our cabin and ticket. And now you have a clean data, meaning that you drop away the columns that you are not going to use it, and also you fill up the missing values. If you have missing values in a column, even you have one missing value, right? Some of the modeling algorithm will not proceed. Yeah, it will stop because you have missing values. So it's always good to treat those missing values. And after that, you can use the info command to look at all the different columns in your data set. You have to be able to differentiate between discrete and continuous numbers.
You done your installation? You done your installation? Slow. Okay, so next we are going into uh, we are going into the exploratory data analysis part, your EDA part. You are going to explore the data. Now remember the awesome framework, yeah? The first step is to obtain the data, so we get our data set. The second step is to scrub, meaning that you want to clean the data, you know, chuchi, chuchi. Okay, you want to clean the data. After we have cleaned the data briefly, lah, yeah. Then we are going to explore the data and find some significant patterns and trends. Okay, so what we are going to do first, we are going to plot our age. So you can plot it. So if you think that it's very small, right, and very hard to see, we can do some extra coding to make it looks pretty. Oh, freeze. Okay, double. Okay. So what we are going to do is we are going to make it look nice. And that's why we are using SNS. We are using Seaborn to help us to make the chart look pretty. Okay, this is the, the command that you need. Now because this is written in code form, right? So later on when you run any other projects, you can use the same method, same code to process all your other data. So this is a histogram that helps you to understand the distribution of the age. So you see that right in the middle, there's a spike there that's, that goes up very high. That's because we feel a lot of the missing value with our mean age. So we have an extremely high or we have a peak at around 29, 30 years old. That's the average. Otherwise, it still looks pretty much like a normal distribution. And what you can do next is to use the same command to plot the fair. SNS.displot fair, DF bracket fair. You don't have to write the first two lines again, okay? The first two lines is just for you to initialize the code. 
All right, to initialize your, your graph. Okay, so your second part of the code is here. SNS does this plot fair. Okay, so for EDA, right, for explore or exploratory stage, we usually only use 
visualization method. So we combine it with different types of chart. The next type of charts that we are going to look at is the uh, box plot. So box plot is good for us to look at different quartile and the outliers. We can visualize the outliers. Okay, any questions so far? This is just box plot, yeah? You, this is something that you don't usually use it in your presentation. Uh. Most of the time, well, during your presentation, your number one favorite will be pie chart, okay? Don't, don't use pie chart so much. Uh, sometimes you can try different types of charts, like box plot is a very good way to use it. If you want to compare among different groups, right? You can use box plot with another dimension. Okay, this is box plot with class and also fare. So you can look at the comparison between different classes, different passenger classes, and also the fare that they have spent. The previous one is only single dimension, which we only look at fare. We look at the overall distribution of a fare, but this one we look at the overall distribution of a fare among different classes. Okay? And the next box plot is to show you the differences the effect of the port that they embark 
and also the type of fare they have paid. So this one, you can look at X is embark, Y is fare. So you can look at the effect of choosing different passenger class versus choosing different port. So uh, if you look at the, <coughs> the passenger class, class two and class three, they are pretty average. So there's not that many outliers and everybody pay below 100. Class one is the one that you have people pay as little as uh, less than 50 bucks, but you can also, you also get people who pay as much as 512. And if you look at the port, right, where does, uh, wh which port does people pay the most to board Titanic, which is actually C, the Chebok. Q is Queenstown, Queenstown and S is Southampton. If you watch soccer, you'll know those places. So that is for us to understand the distribution in terms of outliers, average, upper bound, lower bound, minimum, maximum of uh, a particular column. Okay, and the effects if we want to compare with other dimensions. Now, okay, any questions? If not, we are going in to look at the survival rate, which is the most important thing that we are looking for. So in order to look at the survival rate, we are going to use this thing called cow plot. Count plot helps you to count. It's a bar chart. So what is good about Seaborn is it does not only specify the type of chart, but it's drawing it based on different functions. So this one, it helps you to count. So we know that zero is the people who did not survive and one is the one who survived. So we have about 500 over people who survived and 300, uh, sorry, who did not survive and 300 plus that survived. And why did I keep emphasizing visualization method, charts, etc. In work, right? At work, yeah? You're not going to show too much of your numbers or tables result to your bosses. Most of the time when you do presentation, even if you become a journalist, like data journalism, we're all using charts and pictures that help us to tell a story. In fact, with current technologies, we are no longer relying on simple chart like this. We have to turn this into some other meaningful things like infographics, for example. Yeah, so this is your basic skills. Okay, but this thing, by looking at the survival rate, right, or the survival count, does not really tell us much about what we want to know. What we really want to know is what is affecting their survival rate. So what we can do here is we are going to add another dimension to our survival plot. We are going to look at the effect of their passenger class and also their survival rate. And you realize that, and this is how you can tell a story. I'll let you run the code first. You can copy a file from your friend.
Okay, so this one is your count plot. But as a data scientist, uh, this, this chart tells you a couple of stories. But this does not tell you the main reason that how to increase or reduce the survival rate. Yeah? So what we want to do is we are going to look at another factor that we believe that it will impact the survival rate, which is the gender. A gender tells you another story. Okay? A sad story. By looking at the survival rate and also your gender, you realize that if you are a male, chances are you won't survive during Titanic. A very high chance that you will not survive. And if you are a female, all right, if a lady, your survival rate is almost double of a guy. Uh, maybe they are tired of living. <laughs> and if you dive into the statistics of this part, right, most of them are married guys that did not make it. The young guy, the old guy, actually they survive. The, if you look at the data set, right, guys at their prime, uh, between 20 to 25 to 45 years old, who are married, they, are, they mostly die. Okay, but the main reason behind is it's not because of their marriage. Uh, it's because of their, uh, they rescue people. Yeah, that's the reason why. But that's a good observation. Okay? That's a good observation. All right, so by using different types of visualizations, it gives you a lot of insights and a lot of perspective that you wouldn't have seen if you just look at the descriptive analytics table, right? Okay, I have one more chart to show you, then we can proceed to the interesting part already. Yeah? Two more charts, two more charts. So up to this stage, you guys should be pretty fluent with the Python coding, your engineering students, I don't have to worry too much, right? So the main thing that you need to consider next is, if you realize most of the things that I've shown you here 
are actually based on absolute count. All right, it's based on the count. So by using count itself is not enough, it's insufficient. I want to know the ratio, the percentage of people who survive. So let's look at their survival rate again, but this time around we're using percentage. So I want to investigate whether a passenger class, will that really affect their survival rate or not? Or really, is that their gender that decides their fate? Okay. So I'm going to draw another plot, but this time around I'm not using cow plot. What I'm using here is a bar plot. All right, I'm using a bar plot. So this bar plot will tell you the survival rate as their y axis, x axis as their class. CI stands for confidence interval, all right, for, for statistic. It's just the, the error bar in between to show you how the 95% confidence interval. Uh, for aesthetic purpose, we don't have to use it for now. And this one shows you that the survival rate of passenger class one is indeed higher than class two, and class two is indeed higher than class three accordingly. Okay, so the very last chart that you need, okay, well, let's draw another one for, for gender. So these are some common charts that we use in our day-to-day -day job. Of course, when the data sets get more complicated, the use case get more complicated, we might use a different combination of graph or charts. But most of the time we use bar chart, column chart, uh, area chart, line chart to demonstrate different uh, use case and explain the, the story, to tell a story that we want to tell. Now this one gives you a very good indicator of the ratio between male and female. Now if you're a female, your survival rate, your chances of survive are very high, 75%. And if you are male, about 18%, this is less than 20%. And the last one is, this is, the code of this one has no difference from the previous one, except I changed the, the field.
The last one is a categorical plot. This is a very interesting visualization that you can look at the distribution of the data points among different categories. So you can look at the distribution of survive, non-survive, and also based on their gender. Right? Male, female, you can have different genders. So, but each, every, uh, every data point is well represented here. So you can see that, like what I have told you earlier, right? Male who did not survive mainly are in their prime age. So Titanic is a very entry-level uh, data set for, for data science tasks. If you go to Kaggle.com, yeah, K-A-G-G-L-E, you can see that there's a competition on this one. So later on, when you build up your skills, you can submit your results to the website for comparison as well.
But when we calculate the, the ratio between the class itself, right? Let's say we look at this one. Let's say we look at the intra class here, right? For example, this is within the class itself. This is also within the class itself. That's why we cannot just look at the mean and the distribution from the, the original one and we need to further explore. You're right. See, even if you look at the insert class, right? This is the this is the numbers of what you get here. So we're looking at the insert class itself. Not just the not just the Okay, next thing we are going to perform a machine learning. So in this particular case, we are going to answer the question whether a person will survive or not, and we are going to build a model to predict it. So in terms of this prediction model, we are going to do, remember the five types of question that we are going to ask, right? And this is the very first one. We are going to ask whether this person will survive or not. It's a binary question. And in data science, this is our very fundamental skills or machine learning, what we call it, a classification. 
what we are going to do here is we are going to help uh, to use logistic regressions to help us to perform classification. Logistic regression is widely used for classification problem when our target variable is binary. It's different from linear regressions because it does not require the relationship between the dependent and independent variables as linear. Uh, this is the mathematics formula if you're interested. But the graphical representation of logistic regression is that using this chart as an example, right? If you spend very little hours studying, the probability of you passing the exam is very low. It's not even touching zero, okay? It's not zero, meaning that by using pure luck or your, your normal day-to-day -day study, you might have a very slim chance to pass the exam. And as you spend more time studying the exam, you are going to get higher chance of passing. All right? And once you reach a certain point, let's say more than three and a half hours or four hours, your chances of passing the exam is almost close to 100%. Yeah? But it's never 100%. La. I mean, nobody can guarantee you that you should pass the exam. Okay? So what we are going to do here is we are going to build a model. Uh, where, where is my Titanic? Okay, so this one is a bit, uh, you have many steps. So we'll do it step by steps. We're going to import um, the sklearn, which is scikit-learn module from Python to help us to build machine learning models. And before that, we are going to convert our string or categorical data into numeric data. So we are going to set male as zero and female as one, and then we are going to map those code into our gender column. Now this is the part where we select the features. In any machine learning task, you need to select a features, which is the input that you need to put into the model. Now even when you do neural network, we are also doing the same thing. gender, which after we have explored, we decided or we concluded that these will be good features or good indicators that will affect the survival rate of the particular passenger. And of course, the value Y, which is the outcome that you want, the observed value is your survive. So let's start with the first one. All lowercase, uh, so it's a bit wordy. Only this part, the rest are uh, straightforward.
Okay, what you need to do next is we are going to prepare our data set for building our model. So the second part is the second part is we are going to convert our male and female into numerical by doing mapping. Okay, I make it into two lines so easier for you to see. But if you can, just, just make it, just type in a single line. And then we select the features that we want. Then we prepare our testing set and training set. Now, in, in practice, we do not use the entire data set for testing as for training. We have to keep a certain portion of the data set for testing purposes as well. And the ratio between training set and testing set, there's no fixed ratio, even in research. But usually we follow 80-20 rules, 80% training, 20% testing, or in our case, I put testing set as 30%. But later on, you will see the performance. So we have a few more lines here, and then uh, that's it for this exercise. We will move on to Q&A. We got some small gift for you, if you can answer my questions correctly. And then, yeah, we'll take a group photo before we go for our break. Anyone haven't finished? I give you I give you another minute, okay?
Okay, yeah? So, we'll go to the very last bit of our model building process or our modeling process, which is to build our logistic regression model. So what we are going to do here is we are going to build a logistic regression model by fitting in our training set, which is our X and our Y. So by providing the training set of X and Y, we are able to calculate the accuracy by using our testing set. So this is the reason why we split the data into 70% and 30%. We use 70% of our data to train the model and we use the remaining 30% to help us to test the model so that we know that our model is working or not and how well it is performing. And in this particular case, the logistic regression model that we build to classify a person or a passenger, whether he or she will pass away in Titanic disaster, is 76.85% by using the fare, the passenger class, and their gender to decide. So later on, after this class, right, when you go back, what you can do is you can use a different data set for a different task that you want to tackle. Or you can work on this data set by changing the fields. So you can try to put in more fields or more variable and see whether you perform better or you become worse. So I give you another line of code so that you can test it all together, yeah? So the last line is logistic regression model dot predict and I put the data into a single array or a single list, what we call it in Python. 40, we follow the features that we set, right? Fair, passenger class and your gender. So if you pay 40 bucks, and you are first class passenger and you are a female, your chances of surviving Titanic based on our logistic regression model, you will survive. And if I change this to a guy, right? Uh, you won't survive. <laughs> okay. And I think no matter how much you pay for the ticket, you also won't survive. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't matter which class as well. I would think that age is a factor that you can try, yeah? you can try, but you have to experiment it yourself.
As long as you get an output, right? The warning is fine. Eh? The warning is because of uh, version issue. So you are running 3.7, I'm running 3.6, so you get, you get different results. Other than that, everything is fine. Okay. So what I've done here is I have walked you through a simple exercise of using a real world data set, a titanic data set that we go through the entire awesome framework, uh, obtaining data, scrubbing data, exploring data, modeling data, and explaining the results. And then, uh, any, any question and answer? Any questions? Uh? If, you, if you have, uh, this is how you can reach me, Facebook, LinkedIn, you can go to our channel also. Uh, if you have any, anything that you don't understand related to data science, related to this exercise, I'll pass the slides and uh, source code to Sean or Zisong later. Okay. okay, if you have no questions, I got some goodies here for you. Eh? So, uh, how do you do this? Let me think of a question. Uh, let me see what's inside. Okay. Huh? Slides. Yeah, slides will be given. So I'll give to the organizer and then they will share. You? Yeah, if not, if not, you can just look for me. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah. Shh. Melab, huh? Uh huh. So, uh, instead of using MATLAB, um, can you use matrix and what the. Bizarre. Okay, so if you are currently using MATLAB, MATLAB is mainly for matrix processing, so they have their own libraries also. There's no issue between using MATLAB or using Python. But chances are when you go out, when you work in a company again, the company might not want to purchase MATLAB. Uh, MATLAB is expensive, but Python is open source, Python is free, constantly updated, and you have all sorts of freebies and different libraries. And when you use deep learning also, Python will use open source libraries like Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch. Uh, PyTorch is from Facebook, and then TensorFlow is from Google. So what I'm teaching you here, you need to learn the techniques. So if you want to use logistic regression and those charts, right? They are, they are all available in MATLAB. It's just the syntax is slightly different. So if you want to switch from MATLAB, let's say, to R, you can do that also. R is also open source and free. Uh, it all depends on the company requirement. But when you go for interview, if your boss asks you, like, do you know MATLAB, do you know Python, do you know R, you can easily switch between this, this couple of language. And you have also other tools like Octave, Weka, uh, academics like to use uh, Rapid Miner and also orange, that sort of too, so you can use them too. But you need to find the right syntax. Lah. It does, yeah. So the technique is the same. Uh, okay, the logic is definitely the same. Uh, correct. Boleh, boleh. Kita ada juga. Ah, correct. Uh, yang paling penting itu you punya logic uh, your logic is the most important part ok any other questions ok my first question to you is how much time data scientists spend on cleaning data I count to three and then you raise your hand ok one two three Anyway. Hey, I didn't see any hand. Raise, raise your hand up and high. Your tongue is sucking up. Wait, wait, come again. Huh? Three. Hey, three, I count to three already. Okay, one, two, three. Yes. <laughs> You're supposed to give me answer. You're not supposed to ask me question. That's not fair. So my question is, I'll give you another question. Uh... In which steps data scientists spend the most time? Okay. I haven't counted to three. Okay, one, two, three. 
Ah, okay. Cleaning, right? Yeah. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Oh, okay. I I got I got I got two more here. I got I got two. Huh? Okay, uh, let me think about it. Okay, what is, what is the method that we use when we don't have label data? Okay, here's a question. Huh? What is the method that we use when we don't have label data or label data set as our ground truth? Okay, count to three. Yeah? Three, two, one. Uh, what is it? Huh? Clustering, okay. Okay, last one. Last one's supposed to be the toughest. All right. Don't worry, you still got you still got another round in the afternoon, yeah. Uh, okay. What are the five steps that we use in our data science project? Hey, brother, 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 you got your prize already, brother. Brother, you run before the whistle is blow. You run before I put. Cannot. You already, you already got one, eh? Okay. All right. Uh, so you got a question, yeah? What is the five steps? You, have, you cannot just tell me the short form, no. you have to tell me the entire thing, yeah? Okay, that we use in data science project. One, two, three. Come again, too fast. <laughs> you pick, ah. Uh? <laughs> uh, okay, I don't have AI sensor. <laughs> I have to use manual sensor. One, two, <sighs> three. Okay, you you point, you pick. Ah. Uh, okay. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Okay. 